Okay, so if we just if we would just review what we had done yesterday, we had started with the discussing thermodynamics. We started with the zeroth law, which basically states that you can define a temperature. You can talk about the temperature, uh, and then we looked at the first law. The first law was about the conservation of energy. What is heat? What is work? So of course we had to define what work is, how can we calculate the work, and we had seen that the work done by an object, by a system, depends on the uh, pressure and the volume chain. <coughs> so if you have a finite chain in the volume, you just integrate it to calculate the total work done. And we had also seen that the work depends on how you make the change, not, not just the initial and final states, but uh, here we had this example where we, the state change from state A to state C, through two different processes, and in each one of these processes, uh, the work done was different. And similarly for the heat, the heat would depend on how we go from the initial state to the final state, but their difference depends only on the uh, initial and the final, the difference in the ener internal energy depends only on the initial and final state. So when we are talking about, for example, delta W, we are not really talking about the change in W. But just when we are talking about that U, we are actually talking about the change in the internal energy of the system. And then we looked at the ideal gas. We had studied two different, we had looked at what the pressure is, how the pressure and the volume is related to the internal energy and the temperature. And uh, then there was this question of what happens if we just compress the gas from a very rarefied state. Well, the kinetic theory would be a bit somewhat more complicated, but we looked at, I mean, this is a process in which there is no heat exchange, so which is called an adiabatic process. So we looked at what happens in an adiabatic process to an ideal gas, how the pressure and volume changes, how the temperature changes. And then we looked at another process which is commonly used, so called the isothermal process. This is a process that happens at constant temperature. Well, you see, isothermal processes are, are kind of common in what we see around us. Uh, the temperature of the atmosphere behaves like the heat reservoir, which keeps the temperature more or less constant. And similarly, adiabatic processes also, I mean, all, I mean, although we said that for an adiabatic process, we need an isolated system, and maybe not all systems are isolated, but the critical thing is that there shouldn't be any heat exchange between the environment and the, your system. So if the, the process happens fast enough, faster than the time required to have a significant heat exchange, then that process can still be an uh, adiabatic process. And then just we combine these two isothermal and adiabatic processes and we devise what's called the Carnot cycle. And this Carnot cycle, when we looked at the efficiency of the Carnot cycle, it was kind of uh, interesting because it, tell that it told us that there was a quantity whose integral around an arbitrary closed path was zero. Now basically this allows us to define in mechanics and we have this is what's the definition of a conservative force. The work done around the closed path if it is zero then we say it's, there is a conservative force and hence we can define a potential. Similarly here since the, the integral of this function around the closed path is zero, we can define what, what's called a thermodynamic potential. This is called the entropy, we will call it the entropy, and the basic idea is if we integrate dt over t from a point A to the point B, we will say that this is the dif difference of the entropies between the states, uh, between the states of the system when the system is at state A and the system is in state B. And the fact that the integral of dq over t around any closed path is zero just tells us that this integral is independent of the path. So you see, when we are talking about the work done, the work done as the system changes from state A to state B, it's also a similar integral. But we cannot write that integral as the difference of, two, uh, difference of the values of a given function at these two states, because the work done depends on uh, the process. But for this integral, this integral does not mm -hmm. depend on the process, does not depend on how we go from A to B. So that is what allows us 
to define this function S that we call the entropy. Now, of course, our definition was mainly based on a reversible process, a process in which our system is at any given instant can be considered as in equilibrium. But the second law of thermodynamics kind of generalizes this relation. It says that the integral of dq over t for an arbitrary process, whether it is a quasi-equilibrium, reversible or non-reversible process, it doesn't have to be zero, but it is either zero or less than zero. So it will be zero if it is a reversible process. It will be non-zero if it is a less than zero if it's a non-reversible process. This is the second law of thermodynamics. Now, this law is also sometimes called the uh, increase of the uh, entropy. Let's see. Let's assume we have an isolated system. And something happens in my system by itself. It can be some chemical reaction, a burning, re a burning reaction is also a chemical reaction, or some, I don't, some nuclear disintegration, whatever the process is. Now let's say, let's consider the PV diagram. Right. Initially, the system might be in this state. After my process, the system can be in state B. Well, since it's not a, uh, a diabet, not a, not necessarily a reversible or an in equilibrium process, we cannot always really talk about the pressure and volume of the system at every instant. But nevertheless, for a, a visual uh, aid, let's say, I will just show as some dotted line. The system doesn't really go uh, along that line. Now, to be able to use the second law of thermodynamics, it states us that we need to consider a closed loop. This is not a closed loop. So I will imagine a reversible process, which will take me from B to A, <coughs> from the state B to the state B, in a reversible manner. Now, the second law of thermodynamics tells me that the integral of dq over t over this cycle is less than zero. Now let me divide this into two parts. I go from A to B. This is irreversible. And then I go from B to A. This is the reversible one. This sum should be less than or equal to zero. This is what second law tells me. Well, you see, the system is isolated. So there is no heat given to the system or heat extracted from the system as it goes from A to B. So this is zero. Well, in my imaginary process from B to A, I'm imagining that I'm imagining it to be a reversible process. But in this reversible process, uh, to, be, to, uh, to be able to control my system and so that it will go from B to A, I will probably do some external influences to my system. It's not necessarily an isolated process anymore. But as long as it's a, a reversible process, I can use the definition of entropy. The integral of dq over t from point B to point A through a reversible process is, by definition, the entropy at the state A minus the entropy at the state B. This should be less than or equal to zero. Well, this tells me that the entropy of the point B is larger than or equal to entropy of the point A, of the state A. So this is why we say that the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of an isolated system always remains or increases. So you see, we started by assuming that the system, the isolated system, goes from state A to state B on its own, without any external influence. Then we take this system in state B, and by making some external influences on the system, 
we move, we change the state of the system from B to A through a reversible process. And after this process, and just using this complete cycle, we could say that the entropy of the state B has to be larger than or equal to the entropy of the state A. No, we have a reversible process. No, we, I mean, I didn't really say that. You, you write for this, for the first integral, you said. Oh, okay. In the, hmm. No, you see, what I'm saying is there is this process that is happening in my isolated system. Since it's isolated, there is no heat given to the system, there is no heat taken from the system. So that integral is zero. That is what I said. But I didn't say, for example, that integral is the change in the entropies. It's not equal to the change in the entropy. Because you see, in our definition of the entropy, or the change in the entropy, the way we defined it, we said that we take our system from state A to state B through a reversible process. You see, here, this process has to be reversible. That process has to be reversible. Only for a reversible process, this is the definition we have. For an irreversible <coughs> process, that integral will have a different value. So for example, we look at over here. This is an irreversible process, and that integral has the value 0, not the difference of the entropies. Well, there are other ways of specifying the uh, same conclusion. For example, this law determines in which direction the heat flows. <coughs> For example, let's look at a system. Let's assume we have two separated systems. Let's say they are at temperature T1 and at temperature T2. In which way will the heat flow, if it will flow? Well, we can just look at the second law in the form of the entropy increases if for an isolated system. Let's just assume that the heat flows from the reservoir at T1 to the reservoir T2, at a given time, let's say, the amount of heat flow is Q1. What will be the change in the entropy of my system during this process? Well, the first part of my system loses a heat Q1. So the entropy change in the first part is minus Q1 over T1. So for example, in the first part of my, in the first reservoir, <coughs> if Q1 is a positive number, its entropy decreases. It doesn't contradict the second law because the second law tells me that the entropy should increase for an isolated system. The first reservoir is not an isolated system. But the combined system, the first plus the second reservoir, is an isolated system. So the entropy of the combined system should increase. So this is the change in the entropy of the first reservoir plus the change in the entropy of the second reservoir is Q1 over T2. Let me write it Q1 times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. And the second law tells me that this delta S should be larger than or equal to 0 since we are assuming that the, the combined system is an isolated system and this heat transfer happens on its own. Now, what are the possibilities? It might be that T1 is larger than T2. Let's say both of them are larger than zero. If T1 is larger than T2, 
then 1 over t1 is smaller than 1 over t2, which tells me that 1 over t2 minus 1 over t1 is larger than 0, which combined with the second law tells me that q1 should be larger than or equal to 0. So the heat flows from the first reservoir to the second reservoir if the heat res first reservoir is hotter. Let's look at the other case. If T2 is larger than T1, well, this will tell me that 1 over T1 is larger than 1 over T2, which will tell me that 1 over T2 minus T1, 1, 1 over T1, is less than 0, which will tell me that Q1 is less than or equal to 0. So if the second reservoir is hotter, then Q1 should be negative, which basically tells me that the heat flows in the other direction from the second reservoir to the first reservoir. So again, heat flows from the hotter reservoir to the lower reservoir. Now, let me also look at the case what happens when, for example, T1 is larger than 0, which is larger than T2. Now, we will see cases where the temperature can actually be negative. So if this is the case, now you see T2 is negative, which means 1 over T2 is also negative. Since T1 is positive, 1 over T1 is positive. 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1 is less than 0, which tells me that Q1 should be less than 0. So if the temperature of the second reservoir is negative, the heat flows from the reservoir at negative temperature to the reservoir at positive temperature. So in this sense, whatever that means we will discuss later on, if there are negative temperatures, negative temperatures are not colder than zero, zero degrees, zero Kelvin, but they are actually hotter than infinite degrees. So the, because the heat flows from negative temperatures to positive temperatures. So let me just give you a hint for the time being, what does it mean to be a negative temperature system? You see, if you combine everything we know up to now, so let's just consider a very small change in a given system, the U, the change in the internal energy of my system <coughs> will be equal to, well, this is uh, the heat given to the system. Well, the heat given to the system will be now the temperature of the system times the entropy change minus the work done by the system, which will be just PEV. Mm. Or let me write it in a slightly different form. The yes, the change in the entropy of my system is 1 over T times DU plus P over T times DV. Now, we all study this. What is, how does the entropy change with the properties of the system when we uh, look at uh, statistical mechanics of the system? But you see, 1 over the temperature is actually the derivative of entropy with respect to the internal energy of the system when you keep the volume fixed. So how does the entropy change as we increase the energy of the system? For most systems, the end, as you change the in increase the energy of the system, the entropy will increase. But there are some particular cases, special cases, in which the entropy will decrease if you increase the energy of the system. So in this sense also, but for such a system, since the entropy is decreasing as we are increasing U, 
This derivative is negative, and hence the temperature is negative. But still, you are increasing the energy. Negative temperature states basically have larger energy than positive temperature states. So we will see, we will see some particular examples, and they have been even experimentally created. Negative temperature states. We we can study them. You know they exist. But as I said, they are kind of particular states. So, in this example, for example, we use the second law uh, to describe in which direction the heat will flow. Now, the second law also has, uh, you can also state it in different ways. For example, you can say that Well, basically, this derivation is another statement of the second law, which, said, which says that heat cannot flow spontaneously from a cold re colder reservoir. to a hotter one. So basically heat, heat flows from hot to cold. It cannot go the other way around. Well, another statement of the second law no machine can convert heat completely into work well let's see how does this come from the second law well let's assume there exists a machine that con that can convert heat completely into work. Now, I will just show it in this way. So this is some reservoir at temperature T1. This is another reservoir at temperature T2. This colder reservoir. And so there is this hypothetical machine, let me show it by a <coughs> rectangle, which takes heat from the hotter reservoir, let's say Q1, converts it completely into work. Somewhat. Well, you see, we, we also have our karma engine. What does Carnot engine do? We said that it's a reversible machine, so it takes some amount of heat, converts some of it to uh, work, and some of it just dumps into the colder reservoir. But it's reversible, meaning that I can run it the other way around. I can do work on my Carnot engine. Using that amount of work, it will take some heat from the colder reservoir and dump it into the hotter reservoir. I can just run it in reverse. Well, here I have a machine which outputs work. Let me use that work to run my Karma engine in reverse. So here is my Karma engine. I can just use this work to run my Karma engine in reverse. Now, what it will do is it will just take some heat let's say Q2, and dump some heat. It will take heat from the colder reservoir, this time it's running backwards, and dump it into the hotter reservoir. And this will be Q2 plus W. Well, W, by the way, is nothing but Q1. 
if en since energy is conserved. Now this I have a this combined system is another heat engine which takes heat from the colder reservoir and dumps it into the hotter reservoir on its own, spontaneously. I can just imagine this combined system as an isolated system on its own. But this cannot be. It violates the second law, the previous statement of the second law. You see, heat, ca heat cannot flow spontaneously from a colder reservoir to a hotter reservoir. But this machine, if it existed, would violate that statement and hence lower the entropy spontaneously. Again, this cannot exist. Now, again, using second law, we can prove that, I mean, we imagine this karma engine. It was a simple machine, a simple reversible machine. But maybe and we calculated its efficiency. Maybe somebody more clever than me, or cannot than us, can come up with a, another more complicated design which will be more efficient than the karma engine. But that will again violate the second law. So no machine can be more efficient than a Carnot engine. Let's see why that, why that is. So let's assume there is a machine that is more efficient than a Carnot engine. So let's take our two reservoirs, T1, T2, which is colder. Let's put our hypothetical engine over here. It will take some heat from the hotter reservoir, dump some of it <coughs> into the colder reservoir and do some work. This is more, we are assuming that this is more efficient than the Carnot engine. which basically states that omega over Q1 is larger than T2 over T1. <coughs> no, hold on, 1 minus T2 over T1. Omega over Q1 is the efficiency of this machine. We had seen that the Carnot engine, the efficiency of the Carnot engine is 1 minus T2 over T1. This is my Carnot engine. Let me run this W. You see, I am my engine more efficient than my Carnot engine. Let me use this machine to run my Carnot engine in reverse. There is this work extracted. Let me just use all of that work to extract some heat from the colder reservoir and dump some of it to the hotter one. And from the Carnot engine, I know that omega over Q1 prime 
You see, if I run it in the forward direction, this Carnot engine will take Q1 prime, do the work W, and dump Q2 prime. So omega over Q1 prime would be the efficiency of this Carnot engine, which is 1 minus T2 over T1. But omega over Q, Q1 is larger than omega over Q1 prime because of our assumption that the initial engine is more efficient, this hypothetical engine. But this tells me that Q1 is smaller than Q1 prime. So if you look at the hotter reservoir, what I'm doing is I'm taking some small amount of heat from the hotter reservoir by this hypothetical engine and dumping more heat to the hotter reservoir by this A. Carnot engine running in reverse. So I'm dumping heat to the hotter reservoir. Where does it come from? From the colder one. If you just look at, if you just calculate Q2 and Q2 prime, basically using the energy conservation also, what you do is you are taking the net effect of this combined system is it takes heat from the colder reservoir and dumps it into the hotter one <coughs> spontaneously on its own. There is no external influence to the system. contradicts the second law. So again, no engine can run more efficient than the Carnot engine. But I can use exactly the same argument to also prove that no reversible engine can be less efficient than the Carnot engine. Just reverse the positions of the Carnot engine and the hypothetical engine. So basically, this argument proves that every reversible engine running between two heat reservoirs have to have exactly the same efficiency. It can be very complicated, much more complicated than the Carnot engine, but no matter how complicated it is, it cannot be more or less efficient than the Carnot engine. Of course, realistic systems will be less efficient than the Carnot engine because realistic systems <coughs> will not be completely reversible. Mm -hmm. So there will always be some losses. Now let's also look at the third uh, therm thermodynamics third law and look at some more relations between thermodynamic quantities. This is basically the statement that the entropy of the system as a function of pressure and temperature. You see, the second law tells us how the entropy, what are the entropy differences between two states. It doesn't really tell us what is the value of the entropy, just the differences. So we have to take a reference point, reference state, define the entropy of that reference state, and then we know the entropy of my system at a given, at an arbitrary state. The third law fixes that reference point. It's, it says that the entropy of the system at t is equal to zero, is equal to zero. At zero temperature, the entropy of every system should be zero.
Uh, you always hear the fact that the zero temperature we cannot really reach. The zero, absolute zero temperature. Yeah, it is due to this third law. You see, basically, how do we cool the systems? We have a given system, how do we cool it? It's very big in the first process of as we did in the yeah. first process of the kernel. Well, you see, for example, if you look at the kernel engine, it's a cycle. So whether you run it in forward direction or in reverse direction, there is always some, uh, what to say, some, ah, you're, so you are saying that I, I run the kernel engine in reverse, not take a heat reservoir, but a finite system. So the temperature of the colder reservoir gets colder and colder and colder. Uh, okay, that, so that's, that's a possibility, right? So what are we actually doing there? Let us see. There's some entropy of the colder reservoir as a function of temperature. Well, the entropy depends on volume, pre or volume pressure and two of the volume pressure on or temperature, we can think of it as a function of pressure and temperature, let's say. And so the second reservoir is at some, at some pressure. Okay, so what do we do? We just... Uh, hmm. Now then the question is, how much do we drop the... Let, let's look at the problem. Okay, let, let's look at an example, that example. Now, what I will, let me just finish this, uh, some other example, let's say, and then we can discuss what happens in, in that <coughs> process. Basically, the idea will be the same. It's the entropy as a function of T, whatever the pressure of my system is, should always go to zero, or let's say a volume. whatever the volume of our system is, it should always go to zero. So this is our, let's say, our trajectory at some volume V, V1. This is some other constant volume V2. What can we imagine? For example, we have an adiabatic process. We extend it, we change the volume, we increase the volume. It cools down. If we have a colder reservoir, then we bring it in contact with the colder reservoir and compress it. So the temperature stays the same. Then we let it adiabatically expand again, and then keep it its uh, volume constant, temperature constant, compress it. Now, these expansions <coughs> will basically keep the entropy constant but lower the temperature. And then by keeping the temperature, we should find some means of extracting heat. So the system, if you just keep the, the two volumes constant, at every step, you let the system expand at constant adiabatically, at constant entropy. Then you find some means of lowering the ent extracting energy from the system at constant temperature. At every step, the drop in the temperature gets smaller and smaller. So basically, in order to reach the zero temperature, you need infinite steps. Well, the expansion of your system from some smaller volume to a larger volume, let's say, will take some time, some finite amount of time, which will not go to zero. So every step takes a finite amount of time and hence, it will take uh, you know, infinite amount of time to go to zero Kelvin. So that's basically why you cannot reach the zero uh, Kelvin. It will take infinitely long. Now let's see what your friend, uh, what, uh, your friend has proposed. So let's say we have a we do have a reservoir, 
at, let's say, some temperature T0. Then here we have a finite system that we are trying to pool. Let's say at a given time, this is the temperature is T. And T is less than T0. And eventually, since it's getting colder and colder, T will be eventually less than T0. So let's just assume from the start that T is less than T0. Now, let's say that we are running the Carnot engine in reverse. We are doing some work, so it's extracting heat from the colder reservoir and dumping it to the hotter reservoir. The volumes of the, the minimum and maximum volumes of my Carnot engine is fixed. Let's say it's, it's a finite engine. Right? So let's say the Carnot engine is basically running between the, uh, let's say this is my Carnot engine. <coughs> This is the PV diagram of my Carnot engine. And this volume, we, which we called V2, this is the volume which we called V0. V0 and V2 are fixed. Whatever the temperature of the heat reservoir is, the size of the, the V0 is the minimum size of my Carnot <coughs> engine, V2 is the maximum size of my Carnot engine. So the, the, those two are fixed. So what does that tell me? How much heat can I take from the Carnot engine? Now this is the hot reservoir. This is the temperature T0. This is the colder reservoir. This is the temperature at T. So this is here what I have V3. Now this is V1, this is V3. Now we had already looked at what, what are the constraints. Since this is an adiabatic curve, this is also an adiabatic curve. We said that V0 over V3 is equal to V1 over V2. So we, we are fixing V0, we are fixing V2, but V1, V3, they are kind of free parameters. So we somehow need to determine those, or even we need to, uh, okay, so what are the unknowns we have? Let's fix the unknowns. We don't know V1, we don't know V3, we don't know Q1, and we don't know Q2. Q1 is the heat taken from the uh, colder reservoir, Now this is, let, let's say, this is Q1, the hotter reservoir, this is Q2. Mm -hmm. Now we already know certain properties. For example, Q1 over Q2 is equal to uh, T0 over T. This is another constraint we have. Now Q1, we had already calculated actually Q1 is n times k times t0 logarithm of v1 over v0. No, v1 over Now Q1 is the heat given as it goes from V0 to v, V1 to V0, so it is V1 over V0, this is also what we know. So how should we proceed? Now what I'm, I will be trying to prove is that at every step the drop in the temperature will get smaller and smaller. So that is what I'm kind of trying to uh, prove. 
<coughs> as T gets smaller and smaller, the drop in the temperature will get smaller and smaller. So that in order to reach a zero Kelvin, I will need to do infinite steps. But infinite steps need, will take infinite time. So in a finite time, I will not be able to reach zero Kelvin. So how can we express V1 in terms of V0, V2, and the temperature? as a function of V0, V2, T, and T0. This is what I would like to obtain, so that I will know what Q1 is. And once I know, or Q2 is similarly, NKT logarithm of V2 over V3. If I can express V3 as a function of V0, V2, T, and T0, I know how much heat I can extract at a given step. sufficient equations let's say let me try to eliminate v1 first of all v1 is v2 over v3 times v0 or v2 times v0 over v3 no right V0 times 1 over V3. So wherever I see V1, I can just put this expression. So how does it help me? So my purpose here <laughs> Okay, I have these relations, maybe I can even find some more. The, the purpose will be, what is Q2 as a function of my given parameters? Are they enough? Did I specify enough parameters, first of all? Now, what are my parameters that I specified? I said that there is this hotter reservoir at temperature T0, the colder one at temperature T. I'm running a Carnot engine in reverse. The minimum volume of this Carnot engine is V0. The maximum volume is V2. So those are also fixed. So what should be the intermediate volumes? So you see these intermediate volumes is, uh, since I'm running in reverse, I just, uh, I started from, if I start from the uh, colder reservoir, it is at the smallest volume. I'm just uh, detaching my Carnot engine from the, hottest res colder reservoir and letting it, exp ex uh, I'm compressing it adiabatically. It's at V2, it's at the largest volume, so I'm compressing it adiabatically. Until which point should I compress it adiabatically? <coughs> this is my volume V1. Or I can look for what is V3. V3 is, uh, what is V3, so it's in contact with my hot reservoir, it is compressed, <coughs> it has this smallest volume, then I detach it from the hot reservoir, I let it expand adiabatically, so that its temperature drops. Oh, okay, okay so since I'm on an adiabatic curve, I know that T0 times V0, okay, T0 times 
v0 to the 2 thirds. This is equal to t times in the lower reservoir. This is an adiabatic curve. So here, since it's an adiabatic curve, t times v to the power uh, 2 thirds is constant. At the top point, the temperature is T0, volume is V0. At the bottom point, the temperature is T, volume is V3. So V3 <coughs> to the power 2 thirds, this is equal to T0 over T times V0 to the 2 thirds. So the amount of heat I take from the lower reservoir at every cycle will be NKT, the temperature of the lower reservoir, logarithm of V2 over V3. Well, V3 is T0 over T to the power 3 halves times V0. This is NKT, logarithm of t over t0 to the power 3 halves times v2 over v0, which goes to 0. So the amount of heat I extract from the lower reservoir gets smaller and smaller at every step. Now, of course, there's still the question, how is the change in the temperature, uh, heat extracted related to the temperature? So this is the heat extracted. Now, to specify that property, we define what is called the heat capacity of a given system. The heat capacity C is equal to the heat given to the system divided by the temperature change that, that how much heat causes in the system. Well, we had already seen that the heat given or heat, taken, heat given to the system depends on the process. So the heat capacity also depends on process. Let's say we can write this in a slightly different form. Let's say this is the temperature, the delta Q is T times delta S over delta T. So the specific heat of a given system for a particular process is temperature times the derivative of entropy with respect to the temperature for that particular process. For example, you can talk about the specific heat at constant pressure. In that case, you have to express entropy as a function of pressure and temperature. Take the derivative with respect to temperature at constant pressure. Or you can talk about the specific heat at constant volume, in which case you have to take that derivative keeping the volume constant, not the pressure. And they will have different values. Well, you see, what does the third law tell me about this specific heat? Now, because once I know the specific heat, the heat given to the system or taken from the system will be related to the temperature change in the system through that process. Well, let's see. Let's start with what the third law tells me. The third law, let's say at a constant pressure, for example, The third law tells me that entropy as a function of pressure and temperature should be some coefficient of th that depends on pressure only times the temperature raised to some power plus terms of the order of T to the beta, which is larger than alpha. As temperature goes to zero, the entropy should go to zero. So the entropy should have such a dependence some positive power of T now let, let me just call this D 
some positive power of t multiplied by some function that depends on pressure. Just imagine you are making kind of a Taylor expansion or some other expansion in temperature. This is the first term. So the specific heat at constant, let's say, pressure would be temperature times the derivative of entropy with respect to temperature at constant pressure, which is alpha times temper uh, temperature times this coefficient times t to the power alpha minus 1 as t goes to 0. So Cp would just behave like <coughs> alpha times dp times t to the power alpha, or alpha times the entropy, basically. So this is how, well, in fact, this is a bit more or less how the uh, specific heat will behave, whatever the process is, some coefficient alpha multiplied by the entropy. And alpha is positive. Entropy goes to zero, so a specific heat also goes to zero. Now let's go back. The delta Q in every cycle is this one. Delta T would be just delta Q over C. This is NKT logarithm of T over T0 to the power 3 halves times V2 over V0 divided by C is alpha S. This is the temperature drop at every cycle of my heat engine. Now from here I cannot really say uh, much more because what is the entropy of my system? It will be t to the alpha, but it, what is alpha? Is alpha larger than zero, smaller than zero? No, it's definitely larger than uh, zero, but is it larger than one, smaller than one? I don't really know. And I don't know how to specify it at this moment, let's say. But the basic idea is that if the claim that zero temperature is never attainable is correct, this should basically tell me that the entropy, this, this delta t should go to zero at every cycle. <coughs> and since every cycle takes a finite amount of time, and in order to go to zero, I need an infinite amount of cycle because the drop will be get smaller and smaller. So basically, there's no, we cannot reach zero temperature at finite steps, at, in a finite amount of time. How would you like to propose it? How, how would you? Um, for example, if you want to dump uh, heat from hotter reservoir to colder one, um, you will your efficiency will drop to zero as you take the heat take heat from hotter reservoir. Well, you see, if depends on how you define the efficiency. Let's say. If you define it like this, the efficiency basically goes to 1. So if we had a cold reservoir at 0 Kelvin, it will be perfectly efficient. Because the colder temperature will be 0, so the efficiency will be 1. Yeah, but efficiency is equal to omega over Q, right? Mm -hmm. so, so basically, a uh, heat reservoir at 0 Kelvin <coughs> Will, be, uh, will result in a machine 
that can convert the heat into completely work. No, no, I mean, when you consider the inverse process, okay. as we are trying oh, okay. to mm -hmm. take heat from colder one, it will get, I mean, impossible. Well, you see, in that case, I would say, for example, we are talking mainly of heat engines. So heat <coughs> engines, are their efficiency is smaller than one meaning that you take some amount of heat and then convert it into work. Only a part of that heat is converted into work. But refrigerator is basically a heat engine working in reverse. So what will be the efficiency of the heat engine? How will you define the efficiency of a refrigerator? So what does a refrigerator do? So these are the, your reservoirs. A refrigerator would take heat from the colder reservoir. Let's say this is Q1. You give some work to the refrigerator in the form of electricity, for example. And then it dumps this heat into the hotter reservoir. So in this case, you would define the efficiency as Q1 over W. The heat taken through. So basically, how much heat can you take for a given amount of work? Now here, Q1 over Q2 for this heat engine is basically still T2 over T1. So this Q1 over W, I can say that this is, uh, or let me look at the inverse of that one. Eta inverse is omega over Q1. Well, omega is Q2 minus Q1 over Q1. This is uh, Q2 over Q1 minus 1, which is, well, Q2 over Q1 is T1 over T2 minus 1. This is eta inverse. T1 minus T2 over T2. So eta is T2 over T1 minus T2. So basically this tells me that for a refrigerator, if the inner temperature and outer temperature are very close to each other, the efficiency can be larger than 1. So you are basically, you, you will be basically taking more heat from the colder reservoir than the work that you do. In that sense, the efficiency will be larger than 1. Or if you want to look at a, not a refrigerator, but a, let's say an air conditioner. In the case of the air conditioner, heater. For the heater, the efficiency will be how much warmth do you get inside for a given amount of work. So for the heater, it will the efficiency will be defined as Q2 over W. which will be always larger than 1. Because for a given amount of work, you are taking some heat from outside. What you give inside will be just the sum, assuming there are, of course, no leaks. And if there are leaks, some of that, the work that you do will basically go to the colder reservoir. So that's why the leaks will drop your efficiency. But assuming you have a well isolation of your system, the efficiency of a heater will always be larger than one. For example, in that sense, an, air con an electric air conditioner, like the ones we have in this classroom, is more efficient than, let's say, a, 
the radiators. Because in the best case, the radiator, what the radiator will do is somewhere, in somewhere we are burning some uh, wood or coal or fuel, and the maximum heat that the uh, radiator can give us, give inside, will be equal to the heat created by that burning process. So the efficiency of the radiator at maximum will be one. But the air conditioner also takes heat from outside. So its efficiency will be larger than one. Yes, so now, which efficiency are we talking about? <laughs> Back to your question. Yeah, if you define uh, efficiency like this, um, then we can say that as we uh, make the colder reservoir colder, and the efficiency will drop to zero, right? Okay. Which means, which means that you cannot get any heat from the refrigerator inside of the refrigerator. Yeah. You see, uh, let's go back to the previous derivation that I have present, we have presented here. There, we already had seen one thing. At every step, the amount of heat you can extract from the colder reservoir is getting smaller and smaller, basically what you are saying. But then there is a problem. How is the heat related to temperature change? So we are, extract, we are saying that we are taking smaller and smaller amounts of heat from the system. But if that small amount of heat that we extract would cause a huge change in the temperature, then I, I might still be able to obtain the uh, zero Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So I should look at, at every cycle, let's say, how much does the temperature drop? Not just the heat taken, but how much does it drop? The efficiency will still tell me how much heat I will be able to extract at every cycle. So in that sense, what happened is we had this, the change in the temperature at, at every cycle was given by, determined by, also determined by the dependence of entropy on the temperature as the temperature goes to zero. How does the entropy go to zero? For example, if we didn't do any mistake over here, if entropy goes to zero as T goes to zero as, as T squared, let's say, then when I look at over here, delta T at every step gets larger and larger. The drop in the temperature gets larger and larger, so I should be able to reach uh, zero Kelvin in a finite amount of steps. But I can tell you that it will not happen because zero Kelvin will basically mean zero energy. Now it's reaching zero Kelvin will mean we, are, we have reached zero energy of the system. But at every step we are taking out a smaller and smaller energy, smaller amount of energy. So in order to be able to reach uh, zero energy, we have to carry out infinite number of steps which is not possible in a finite amount of time. Would you like to give a break or should we just continue for let's say, I don't know, half an hour more and then the course will be over? Well, we have half an hour. So it maybe you. Yeah. Maybe we should just continue for 15, 20 more minutes. Uh, there are just a couple of more things I would like to mention about thermodynamics. And <coughs> after that, basically, the, uh, our discussion on thermodynamics will be over. So, what are some of the consequences of these thermodynamic the laws we have? Well, 
the laws we have, we have just written it in this form, TDS minus PDV. This, uh, this relation is a consequence of the thermodynamic laws. Now, one thing that we didn't discuss is, for example, we didn't discuss, uh, what about if you put our system in a magnetic field? Can we calculate the magnetization? How will be the magnetization related to this one? Well, if you put our system in a magnetic field and if it is magnetized, you can change its energy by changing the magnetic field also. And magnetization is nothing but, let's say, let's, let me write it in this form. This is the magnetization dot dB. Or you can talk, put your system into an electric field. If you put a, this, your system in, in an electric field, it will get uh, polarized. And so you can calculate the, the, and since it will get polarized, it will also, there will be also an energy due to this polarization. Well, let me, this is not minus, this is, this is not plus, that is minus. Well, there will be an electric polarization, which we can also write as D dot E, D E. No, okay, so this is not D. P is the electric polarization. Let me still use U here. M is the magnetization. Well, if this is correct, then I can calculate them. If I could determine the internal energy of the system as a function of entropy, volume, magnet magnetic field, and energy, well, I can just write it, uh, let's say the magnetization would nothing be but the minus the gradient of U, the gradient with respect to the magnetic field. It's not with respect to x, y, and z, but with respect to bx, by, bz. Keeping the entropy, the volume, and the electric field constant. Similarly for the electric polarization, it will be minus the gradient with respect to the electric field of U, keeping S, V, and B constant. So if we can determine U as a function of the other parameters, then we can calculate all of them. Well, in practice, it's not really U, I mean, it's not easy to calculate U as a function of the other parameters, but rather we calculate S. You see, ds is equal to 1 over t du plus p over t dv plus m over t db plus p over t de. So in statistical mechanics, most of, well, at least in the, when we study microcanonical ensemble, we will be calculating s as a function of other parameters. So then, well, the temperature is nothing but the derivative of S with respect to U, the internal energy, keeping V, B, and E constant. Pressure over temperature is just the derivative of entropy with respect to V, keeping U, B, and E constant. Magnetization over temperature will be nothing but the gradient of S with respect to B, the, the components of the magnetic field keeping U, B, and E constant. And the polarization of our system over T will be the gradient of, with respect to the components of E of S keeping U, V, and E, B constant. So once we calculate the entropy, we know everything. Magnetization, polarization, or whatever you can imagine. Now, for the time being, let's just forget about this uh, magnetization and uh, <coughs> electric field and electric polarization. Let's just stick with the UV, P, T, etc. So, what do we know? We know that VU is equal to TDS minus PDV. 
So temperature as a function of S and V, we can express it as the derivative of U with respect to S, keeping V constant. And P is a function of S and V. This is minus the derivative of U with respect to the volume, keeping S constant. Now let me take these two relations and look at what happens when I take the derivative of temperature with respect to V, keeping S constant. You see, this is, for example, in an adiabatic process, how does the temperature of a system change as a function of the volume? This will be equal to, <coughs> well, the, if you just take the derivative of the first line, that is nothing but the second derivative of u with respect to first s than v. But second derivatives, I can always exchange their places. So the second derivative of u with respect to s first and v first is the same as the second derivative of u with respect to v first and then s. But if I take the second derivative with respect to V of U, mm -hmm. that is nothing but the pressure. So that is minus derivative of pressure with respect to S <coughs> at constant volume. You see, we had already studied for an ideal gas what is the derivative on, on the left hand side. In an adiabatic process, we know how temperature and volume depends on each other. So that tells me, at least for an ideal gas, how the pressure of the system changes as I change its entropy at constant volume. Basically, I have two completely different processes for the ideal gas. One is an adiabatic process, one is a uh, process at constant volume, an isotoric process. I can relate these two. The change in the temperature as a function of volume in an adiabatic process to the change in the uh, pressure as a function of the entropy in an isotoric process at constant volume. Now, change in the entropy will basically cause a change. I'm giving heat to the system and hence causing its energy to, to change, temperature to change and hence the pressure will change. So, how does that happen? What is the, what is the dependence? Well, this relation tells me. Well, this is basically based on the fact that there is a function called mm -hmm. U. If there is a function called U and the temperature and pressure are defined as its derivatives, then that relation should hold, whatever the system is. And thermodynamics already tells me that that function U exists. <coughs> well, I can basically do similar tricks for other uh, variables. For example, I know that du is equal to Tds minus Pdv. Well, let me just look at, look at du minus Ts. This is minus SdT minus Pdv. This is most of the time called F. It should be the Helmholtz free energy. So if I can calculate somehow this F, then entropy, I can obtain the entropy as minus the derivative of F with respect to T at constant volume, and P is just minus the derivative of F with respect to volume at constant temperature. Well, nice, so I can just take the second derivative of S with respect to volume, at constant temperature, this should be equal to the second uh, derivative of P with respect to temperature at constant volume. So this tells me how the entropy changes as a function of volume at constant temperature. Well, it's the nice thing about this is the right hand side is nothing but what we call the equation of state. It's a relation between T, V and T. Uh, we already know what that is for the ideal gas. For the ideal gas, PV is equal to NKT, so at constant volume, pressure is just depends linearly on the temperature. Well, let's just do one application of this relation. 
we know that du for whatever the system you can imagine is always given by this expression. Now let's look at how the internal energy depends on, let's say, volume. <coughs> at constant temperature for a given system. This will be equal to T times dS over dV at constant temperature minus P, which is equal to T times dP by dT at constant volume minus P. Everything on the right hand side is easy to measure. Pressure is easy to measure, temperature is easy to measure, T, T and V relation is what we call the equation of state. We can determine it experimentally. So by, ju by just using this knowledge, we can determine how the energy, internal energy of a system changes as a function of its volume at constant temperature. You see, this information will, we had already, we, uh, the temperature is basically a measure of the kinetic energy of the system. So if we are looking at constant temperature, you can just say that, okay, so since we are looking at constant temperatures, the kinetic energies are more or less constant. That's what we expect. So this derivative on the left-hand side gives us what is the potential energy between the particles making the system. For an ideal gas, dP over dT at constant volume is just P over T. So for an ideal gas, d over dV at constant temperature is T times P over T minus P, this is zero. You see, in fact, the only th information we use about this ideal gas is that PV is equal to NKT. As long as PV is equal to NKT for whatever system you have, the it in turn, its internal energy does not depend on the volume. It only depends on its temperature. Well, you can generalize this. So we had seen <coughs> Okay, we started with du is equal to T d s minus P d v. Especially if you are work working with solids or liquids, well, you don't really keep it their volume constant. <coughs> you keep their pressure constant. Because most of the time, if you just heat a solid, it will expand. If you want to keep its volume constant, you have to exert a huge amount of pressure, which in general is not available. But most of the time when you are heating a solid, you are doing it at constant pressure, the atmospheric pressure. So we can say the, the U plus PV oops, sorry, is equal to TDS plus VDP. This is called the enthalpy. So what, do we, what can we say? Uh, T is equal to DH over DS at constant pressure, V is equal to dH over dP at constant entropy. And using these two, we can say that the derivative of temperature with respect to pressure at constant entropy should be equal to derivative of volume with respect to entropy at constant pressure. Now, these are true, by the way, whatever your system is. They can be liquids, they can be solids, they can be gases, they can be more complicated systems. In equilibrium, the dependence on temperature, uh, on pressure <coughs> for an adiabatic process should be related to the dependence on volume, uh, on entropy, it, in an uh, isobaric process at constant pressure. They are fixed by thermodynamics, their relationship. We don't know what they are, but we know that they have to be related by this relationship. Therm thermodynamics, unfortunately, doesn't tell what they are, but 
it only tells us how they are related. It will be statistical mechanics which will tell us what are each one of these derivatives. And finally, well, I mean, you can just work it out. The, uh, we start with du is equal to tds minus pdv. You can say that d of u minus ts plus pv, this should be equal to minus sdt plus vdp. This is, should be g. And so we have uh, S is minus del G by del T at constant pressure. And V is del G by del P at constant temperature. And so they are derivatives. Derivative of S with respect to P at constant temperature should be equal to derivative of V with respect to temperature at constant pressure, etc. So these are called the Maxwell relations. This one, this one, So basically, let's say the main lesson of, let's say, these two weeks, this week, uh, whatever you want to calculate about your macroscopic system, you can calculate them if you know one or two of, at least one of the thermodynamic potentials, like the, the, how does the entropy depend on the other macroscopic properties, how does the free energy depend on the other parameters, etc. So if you know them, you can calculate everything about the system that you would like to know. You can calculate their pressure, their temperature, their entropy, their magnetization, their polarization, etc. So the, the main aim, let's say, of uh, thermodynamics will be to be able to calculate these thermodynamic potentials. So because once we know them, we know everything else. And we can relate one thermodynamic property to the other thermodynamic properties through some uh, trickery, tricky use of these relations, let's say. And it's just the calculus of uh, multivariables. How does the derivative with respect to one variable relate to the derivative of uh, the other variables, etc.? Okay, any questions? So next week we will just start with statistics. So then see you next week.